everyone. Welcome to the podcast. The podcast that precedes the Cyber Second AI Connected Conference happening this year, November 4th and 5th. Have you registered yet? If you haven't, the link is in the description. Please do so. And with this podcast, we want to talk about the kind of topics that we're going to explore during the event. One of them is pretty exciting. Federated machine learning. It's probably one of the most exciting things happening in AI and cybersecurity right now. And to speak about that, we have Fabrizio Biondi coming from Avast and Richard Chow from Intel. Now, without further delays, let's hear it from our guests. Welcome to the CyberSec uh, podcast, uh, everyone. And uh, today we will be speaking about federated machine learning. It's a pretty complex topic. But before we dive in, I just want to introduce maybe uh, our guests here. And rather than me introducing them, maybe I'll pass the, the word to you. And Richard, maybe just starting with you, um, where are you coming from? Maybe your, your about, a little bit about your role in uh, Intel to our audience. And also, how did you get to federated machine learning? Yeah, thanks, Mentos. Glad to be here. Um, so at Intel, I'm a university research manager and scientist. So, our, my, so my job is to uh, work with the academics that Intel funds. So Intel uh, funds probably tens of millions of dollars to, uh, to professors each year to do research in mm -hmm. uh, areas that Intel is interested in. And Intel is quite interested in federated learning these days because um, there, there, there are a bunch of reasons probably we'll get into later. But uh, yeah, it, so federated learning is a, is, a, is a big interest area of Intel's. So personally, uh, my background is in security and privacy. So I did security and privacy research for, for many years and even for decades, we've been talking about uh, privacy preserving ways of doing um, AI. They call it AI these days, but it's been called uh, way, basically ways to sort of infer things about people with, without necessarily wanting to violate their privacy. So, and this federated learning is the latest incarnation of this trend, the most sophisticated and maybe could be the most promising. So we'll see. And um, we have our own uh, uh, Fabrizio Biondi from, from Avast and uh, Fabrizio, what it may be a little bit to the audience, what do you do at Avast and how did you get into federated machine learning? Sure. So at Avast, I am a staff scientist in artificial intelligence. So I'm part of the technology and innovation office, and we are constantly trying to improve our internal technology to help defend our users and help protect them and their digital life better and better. And the way we got to work on federated learning is because of the reason of risk that Richard said, which is about privacy preserving. Right. As a cybersecurity company, we need to see actually a very good amount of what happens on a machine to protect the users. So we need to be aware of a lot of things that are happening. But at the same time, particularly as a European company, we want to do this in a privacy preserving way to make sure that all the things that we are seeing, they don't leave the machine or the user as much as possible. If they do, they're completely anonymized, they're, it's they're safe and sanitized so that there is no PII left and they cannot be connected to the user. So we, have the, we need to respond to GDPR regulation and other similar regulations around the world. And so what we need to do is to be able to train our machine learning algorithms, our, our protection algorithms, on what the users are doing without us knowing what the users are doing because that's very important privacy, you know, important private information. And this is why Avast is getting to this research on uh, federated learning that, again, as Richard was saying, could be one of the most promising approaches that we have seen to, to do these attempts at privacy preserving AI in the last decades. Right, yeah. So both of you echo security being really the, the, the key item here, but maybe before we... we dive further, uh, should we maybe just define uh, federated machine learning uh, for our audience in, in, in just a broad sense and uh, maybe give a sense of the kind of problems that it solves and why is it uh, so particularly useful today? 
Uh, maybe starting, Richard, with you. Yeah, so uh, federated learning is basically distributing machine learning to take advantage of decentralized data. So basically, you bring the learning to the data instead of the data to the learning. So mm -hmm. traditionally, you would gather all your data and put it in one central location and then start doing your learning there, right? Um, but here, we, we want to sort of uh, bring the learning algorithm to the data so the data doesn't really have to move. Um, so generally speaking, right, there are users or collaborators in a central server. So the users or collaborators, you know, hold the data and a central server helps orchestrate the machine learning being done by the each user, um, just for terminology. Mm -hmm. So a couple of use cases that uh, people should keep in mind, there's siloed data. So for instance, you know, financial data belonging to different banks or medical data belonging to different hospitals or data belonging to the same company, but residing in different countries and you know, their regulations, you, you may not be able to mix the data from th these countries. And the other, you know, very prominent use case is, you know, data belonging to different devices, like a mobile phone or car, and each device would be considered a user or collaborator. And uh, in addition to the privacy, additional privacy that you get from not having to move the data, a lot of times it's simply impractical, right, to upload the data because of the, the volume of it and how fast it's right. coming. So if you think about an autonomous car, for instance, there's no way you can upload all the data somewhere else to, to learn. So you have to sort of push the learning to the device. Um, and, and perhaps just to help people sort of uh, get this in their, in their head, maybe a simple example of how this might work. So if you, you start with a simple model uh, where each server distributes this model to all the users. So, um, so a model is based a, a machine learning model, a deep learning model is just uh, it's just basically values for a bunch of weights, right? Mm -hmm. Each user, based on its own data, right, computes an update of these weights using some algorithm like uh, gradient descent or something, right? Um, and then sends the update back to the server. So the server gets all these updates from all these users, integrates all the updates, and then you repeat the process until you get something that's stable. And, then, and that's basically, you get a model that works for everybody, at least that's the hope. So that's right. some idea of how these things might work. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of touched on maybe the, some of the advantages, but when, when you're comparing uh, this, this particular model to, to other alternatives, uh, why uh, choose this specific case, uh, Fabrizio? Maybe you can uh, expand here. And if you want to also uh, expand on the definition that uh, Richard uh, provided. Yeah, uh, we need to consider that for some types of analysis and studies, this is the only model, right? There are things that you can study only if the data is kept private. So, for instance, if you have a group of hospitals and they want to do together some study over effectiveness of some treatment, Mm -hmm. but they cannot share private data with each other. The only way they can they can do this is using some federated method. Because otherwise, every hospital will have to do a separate study on a much, much lower uh, number of patients, which will make the study itself much less strong. So instead, like there are no other models that allow you to for different people to work on the same data without sharing the data itself. Mm -hmm. This is also important for competitors, right? This exists in the cybersecurity field where we have competitors, but we also all want together to stop attackers and bad people, right? So we want to have for everybody to be able to stop attackers, but at the same time, we cannot share our data or the data of our customers because it is protected by various secrets and privacy laws. And so uh, there are the cases in which this is an enabling technology. It is allowing us to do things that otherwise just would not happen at all. And there are also cases, uh, research touched on the impracticality of transferring so much data you would have to your backend, but there's also an advantage on the computational side, because for instance, if, you're, um, if you have a keyboard, 
for smartphones and you want to train the T9 over everything that is being typed by each one of your users, first of all, this is very private data. So it just cannot send it back because it, it, will, it tells you everything about the preference of the users. Even if you could send it back, it would be too much data because everything that is typed by everybody all the time is too much. And even if you can just send it back and you could store it, training over such an amount of data will require a gigantic amount of computational power. While if you distribute this over every single phone of everybody, of course, in a way that is respectful of energy usage and does not cost too much training power onto each cell phone, every cell phone is doing a very, very, very small amount of work. But then in the end, you get the same training back without having to have very large machinery and very large data centers that are very expensive. Um, a question that comes up to me is, is how mature is this um, at the moment? How far are we from really this being um, widely available and, and, and practically easy to implement? Uh, maybe Richard, from, from your experience at uh, Intel, where are we now? So, so for Intel, uh, I'd say we're probably at the proof of concept research stage. So one, one thing we're doing now is working with a bunch of hospitals to identify brain tumors with federated learning. So this is the uh, University of Pennsylvania's hospital and a bunch of other hospitals were sort of co-developing this federated learning system, uh, help making it better using the practical example of brain tumor. Um, detection using mm -hmm. machine learning. It's very natural for hospitals, right? They have a lot of regulations against sharing data. So federated learning is, 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 is very natural. Project is going well. Uh, you can read about it online. We have a bunch of uh, material about it, um, but there's a still a long way to go before it's an everyday thing, right? It, it's, it's, it's not something that uh, everybody can start using immediately. Um, so, uh, so that, that's for Intel. And my impression of the industry in general is, yeah, probably most people are in the proof of concept research stage. There are a few companies, I think uh, Google very prominently is using federated learning for, you know, their phones and that, uh, and, and they've, they've publicly, uh, you know, said, some particular things they're doing with federated learning. Um, I, I don't know if you'd classify that as proof of concept research or uh, something higher, but they're probably one of the more advanced companies in that area. Um, but I think I'd say generally we're in the proof of concept research stage. Yeah, and, and if I can, something that I think would be very beneficial to move this to be more widely accepted and used would be some level of standardization where we would be aware of what algorithms are the ones that are commonly used and deployed. So they, that would reduce the amount of effort to bring to the market something based on this. And also we need a level of awareness from the population or from the lawmakers, because right now, if I want to deploy a product in a privacy preserving way, I have to convince from scratch that this the generated learning algorithm I'm using is actually privacy preserving. It is actually doing what it should do. It actually works. So if I do this and I need to get approval by 20 different countries, and then I need to convince everybody that this is not something I invented yesterday in my basement, but it is an accepted method and so on. It takes a lot of effort. Right. So if we manage to spread understanding and awareness of the capabilities and of course limitations of this, of this approach and of the specific algorithm, what are the what are specific federated algorithms good for, what they protect against, what can be used for, then it would be much easier, right, for our lawmakers to already get the dossier that says, okay, this is a known technology. We know how it works. It's easier to pass it to the next stage. So you mentioned standardization and also mm -hmm. the the attitude from um, the, the the lawmakers, the the processes there. Anything else in terms of challenges at the moment that the audience maybe should should, should know about in this area, uh, Richard? 
Yeah, yeah. So it, it's there are a bunch of challenges I think in this in this whole thing. Um, for one, security. Okay, so uh, obviously, federated learning, the attack surface, it's, it's a much more complicated thing. The, so the attack surface is much larger. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, just to give you some ideas on, wh on why, um, how do you trust a collaborator's data? So for instance, if, if we're in the mobile phone case where there are millions of people contributing data, I mean, how do you trust each one? And it's been shown that you can poison training sets, right? With just a small percentage of mislabeled data. And you can target the attacks so only certain classes are affected. Um, now, you can, you can think about, well, there are ways to uh, address this potentially with the trusted execution environments uh, or zero knowledge proofs. So trusted execution environments are, um, it's basically hardware that uh, you can run code in, so you can sort of trust the, that a certain piece of code is running and you can uh, you don't have to rely on sort of the environment outside of the trusted execution environment. Um, so this this is useful both for the server and for the client. So the client can sort of potentially give some privacy invasive data to the server and be have some assurance if the server is running this code in a trusted execution environment that the client can verify that uh, there, there, there's no privacy loss by giving up this data. And the server can likewise verify that the client is, um, is, is doing the algorithm that he's supposed to be doing faithfully. Um, but it's not a complete solution, right? Because a complete solution would mean you have to collect the data inside the TE, which obviously doesn't happen. Um, so, but, but it's, uh, it, it's a, a big step. Um, so you, you could argue that this this problem of people poisoning the data could ha could happen in the in the centralized case too, even before federated learning. Right? You could contribute data that would sort of poison the machine learning. But the difficulty is with federated learning is you don't really get the data. Right? The central server doesn't get the data, so it's it's harder to figure out that it's fake or invalid mm -hmm. so the the, the 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 so detecting the attack is sort of much more difficult another point is um does privacy really in, improve at all so remember it, it, so you're not giving the data to the server but when i describe the basic sort of paradigm um you, you give some updates to the server and so if you're using say gradient descent and you know the model to begin with, there are cases that if you know uh, the direction of the gradient and you know the, the model you start with, that can tell you what data was used to give the update. In other words, that you may be sharing the data basically. Um, there, there are ways to, uh, so these are, these are attacks that are kind of more sophisticated, but it, it may mean that privacy is still at risk, right? Even when you give the updates. Mm -hmm. So, and it's not just, you know, the security and privacy, but there are data is a lot of data issues also, just because it's much more complicated, right? So we haven't talked about, um, you know, federated learning is, of course, works best when um, the data is, is sort of what, what they call IID or sort of has, has the same distribution for each user. So if that's the case, right? Um, it makes sense that when you combine the data from a bunch of users, you get a stronger signal. And so it, it, you wouldn't get a stronger signal from each user separately. So that's why you want to take advantage of other people's data. But a lot of the time, the data is not the same for each collaborator. So if you think about, say, autonomous driving data, the way you drive in India or, or China is probably a lot different than the way you drive in Germany, people drive in Germany, right? Just the environment, the roads and how, and even how they drive. So the, the data is gonna be very differently distributed. So then uh, the advantages of federated learning are a little bit less clear in that case, but may still 
be able to tell you things that you wouldn't know otherwise. And it's hard to sort of figure these things out. Um, system issues with collaborated with federated learning is that, you know, if you think about mobile phones, people are off. The, the phone may be off a, a good percentage of the time, or they may not have the connection that you would normally have in a data, data center, right? In a data center, you have these super highways that the data, the data is traveling along, right? Everything can be very fast. But for federated learning, it's often uh, the communication is the bottleneck, not necessarily the computation, right? Um, another thing is we, we, we talked about hospitals and collaborators. The incentives are a little unclear, right? In the, mm -hmm. in the classical case, the guy doing the, the data mining, um, the central server, he's usually the guy that gets the model and takes advantage of it. Um, but if you think about, if, suppose a hospital well, or, or bank, suppose a bank uh, is able to get a model for, uh, in, in collaboration with, with a bunch of other banks without contributing much of his own data. So he could basically free ride on the federated learning. Mm -hmm. That would be the ideal case for him, right? So what is his incentive to really contribute much data at all as long as he can get the model? So how do you incentivize people to contribute data, right? Uh, is, is a little, it's a tricky problem. So there are a lot, of, a lot of issues that federated learning brings in that didn't really exist before. Systems, security and privacy, economic issues. So it's it's a much more complicated thing, and that's why it's you know it's going to take a long time, I think, to develop. Yeah. So let's let's imagine that um, long time, and let's let's try to um, see ourselves a little bit in in, in the distant future. So in, in the world where we are able to to fully implement this and it's easily accessible widely accessible um, what are some of the what what does that world maybe look like uh, maybe fabrizio uh, starting with you what 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 do you see happening that's really maybe positive positive i think that would give a greater availability of data and smart system train of those data that would be more effective and work better, right? Just, mm -hmm. just because intelligent systems like machine learning models, let's call them with their names, very strongly depend on the amount and quality of the data they're trained on. So if we are starting to share and standardize and make common ways for people to just get much more data for their models, mm -hmm. their models will work better. Um, in some cases, this is arguably a good thing, like we can stop more attacks. Of course, it depends on what you use the data for. If you use the data to do some targeting of some kind, uh, this is not necessarily something people want, but this is hopefully would make it, how you do it, if since you do it in a privacy preserving way, you, you would know better about what the population likes, but it will be much harder to target a single person. With the right way, which is something that right now is absolutely happening for, for instance, targeted marketing campaigns right. and stuff like that, right? You you would get smarter systems that know more about this, the big trends, but less about single people. So you would help preserve the privacy of the people while keeping still some effective, effective arguments there. This would help in many ways. I, again, I, of course, have cybersecurity first in mind. It would, for instance, help us a lot in reducing the amount of false positives, which is uh, one of the main concerns for the cybersecurity industry, is to not have a false positive, which is when you uh, tag as malware something that is not malicious, just because it is very rare or it does some strange behavior. And then you start, you, you know, you are slightly paranoid and you just stop it because I say this, I don't like this, it's suspicious. And to reduce false positives, we need to train on a very large amount of cleanware, so non-malicious data, non-malicious files, but many non-malicious files and cleanware behaviors and so on are private information, IPII. For instance, just think of documents. To recognize malicious documents, we need to see a lot of non-malicious documents to make sure that we know how non-malicious documents look like. 
but we cannot lift non-malicious documents from the machine of the users and send them to backend for training because documents are obviously very private. Like any kind of document in, in, on the user's machine uh, is private, is PII, contains private identifying information. So this would help us a lot to reduce the amount of um, false positives that we have. This, this is my, my cybersecurity view, but research was, for instance, naming cars, right? You want cars to be better at driving themselves and avoid obstacles uh, by not telling you exactly what every person is doing. Right. Uh, so it is known that self-driving car models are extremely complicated, extremely hard because of the amount of real-time data processing and 3D processing they have to do. So clearly having more good quality data there would help a lot. Richard, what, what about, what are you kind of looking forward to here in the future? Yeah, so, you know, the, the dream of the privacy preserving, you know, machine learning is that I think I think the common person feels a little bit better living life, basically. So now, um, you know, I don't I don't know about you, but now when when I go out in public, I, I basically assume that I'm being recorded. Mm -hmm. But either either the the the, the neighbors, uh, you know, cameras that are uh, their security cameras, or in a smart city, there are various all these sensors that are around and. Uh, if if I have Wi-Fi on my phone, I mean, all sorts of things are, are there, there are ways to record what I'm doing, where where I am, uh, even my face. A lot of lots, lots of cameras around. So um, I, I think things have been much different in that regard in the last you know decade or so. Uh, and I think I think most people sort of feel that. Uh, Basically, feel this thing, right? And and when they go on, when they use their computer, it's not it's not even outside. It's even when they use their computer, they go to websites. There's there's a lot of data being collected, maybe for the purposes of targeted advertising, maybe I mean ed many different reasons. But the promise of privacy preserving machine learning is you can achieve all the ends that people collect the data for, right? Um, and preserve people's privacy. Because, you know, for instance, when somebody wants to advertise something to you based on characteristics, I mean, they say, well, people with these characteristics usually are, are in the market for, you know, say a soft, this particular soft drink. But uh, do you really know that need to know that mantis right this <laughs> has these characteristics or no you just want to know a general fact about the population so privacy preserving machine learning would seem to satisfy the need right of of mapping certain characteristics the certain uh, needs and not having to violate people's privacy um likewise for you know iot devices collecting data if you can bring the data, uh, the, the learning to the edge, to the devices, you don't necessarily have to uh, collect the data in a sort of a very privacy intrusive way in databases where you can uh, make people feel so uncomfortable. And so I think, I think that would be the dream state, right? This is this sort of go back to the way we were maybe in the 19, 1950s as far as privacy. We're much, I think people are generally much more comfortable with doing things without feeling that they were being uh, recorded or tracked or uh, analyzed. Um, so, but I think, like I said before, I think there's still uh, a long way to get there. And I'm not sure we'll ever get there just because there's certain things, it'll never some things will never work quite as well right in the, in the de de in the decentralized setting but um let's see how far we get there yeah i'm definitely gonna share your your sentiment about wanting to get into the back to the 50s <laughs> 60s in terms of privacy but uh richard you also mentioned a couple of projects obviously intel uh, google um 
maybe if our audience is really curious to 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 know what else is happening in this area, who they should be sort of reading, following, maybe uh, where would you point them? Which which projects should they be looking at? Yeah, so uh, so Fabrizio and I haven't mentioned the Avast and Intel collaboration. We're, we're collaborating together with a startup called Borsetta in this private AI collaborative research institute. We're, we're funding a bunch of academics in, you know, federated learning in related areas, but a lot of it is federated learning related. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're, we're funding uh, some, well, let me, let me like uh, mention a, a couple of names we're funding. Virginia Smith at CMU is, some, is somebody to keep an eye on. She does a lot of um, machine learning research on multitask learning, which is basically uh, usually when you usually when you do machine learning, you have a particular um, thing you're trying to optimize, right? But suppose there are many things you're trying to optimize all at once. How do you approach that problem? And federated learning is kind of natural for this in the sense that if you have a bunch of different users, and like I said, their data is differently distributed. Um, so their, their optimization is kind of different. How do you optimize the, the federated learning for each user? Um, mm -hmm. So, so uh, she's looking at multitask learning. There's also um, somebody in Singapore, Reza Shakri, who's, who's also a rising star in the area. It's somebody to keep an eye on. He's, he's uh, looking a lot, a lot of the, uh, at a lot of the privacy aspects of federated learning. Um, so I mentioned the, the, the problem of um, potentially your updates sort of leaking your data. Um, so there are ways maybe to add noise to the updates in some way to sort of obscure the original data. But obviously when you add noise, you, your, your machine learning becomes less accurate. So he's, he's looking at... Uh, Things are in that around that. Um, let's see. Other people, other people in the in the in the center are, are looking at trusted execution environments. How to integrate those in the federated learning? Um, uh, so there's a, there's a website for the center that. Uh, I don't know. We, we yeah. could put in the chat window or you could also yeah, no, definitely uh, share it and we'll, we'll include it in the episode uh, notes for, for the audience to, to, to see. Yeah. So, um, and, okay. and anything else, of course, uh, that, uh, you find relevant will, will include in the, the episode notes, but, uh, maybe also, I don't know, Fabrizio, anything you'd uh, add, uh, to the list of, uh, of, uh, people, uh, resources for people to, to turn to. Yeah, so for, well, in the Institute, uh, the Private AI Institute, that we, which are named as, you know, list of projects and collaboration and collaborators, and we are betting a lot on this institute and on the fact that it will advance the, the understanding and the algorithm, but also the application of these. Mm -hmm. uh, like, with the vast, uh, one of the person we are working on closely is uh, Axel Leguet from uh, Université Catholique de Louvain. Uh, he has experience on uh, the, what we call the hospital version of federated learning, right? The one when you have hospitals that want to share the data similarly to what the Intel is doing in, in the project, but we are trying to uh, move that to analysis of file behavior, uh, sample behavior, so that we can see what is happening on a user's machine and classify how good it is without having to send this data to our backend which is with all the advantages that that we listed. So we think you know we will we are actively publishing of course our results. The collaboration with the Private AI Institute is under the agreement that everything we do, all the research that we are uh, sponsoring will be will be published uh, openly and will be able to advance the field. It will not just be, you know, used uh, internally by Avast and Intel. We, we do this to push research, we do this to help spread these ideas and to get them adopted by the larger industry. 
and by meant to by its academic word. Yeah, th thank you for sharing that. Uh, and um, just being mindful of your your time, I I, I want to thank you both for for giving us a very sort of clear picture of what's the state of. Uh, uh, federated uh, learning at the moment, and um, there's a lot to look forward to in, in the future. So um, I'm sure these conversations going to be ongoing between us, and uh, of course uh, we're going to probably touch on it in the CyberSec uh, uh, event uh, this year coming in November. So, um, is there anything, any sort of last notes that you'd like to to maybe touch on in terms of federated learning? Uh, before we sign off, uh, Richard and, and Fabrizio. No, th thanks, Mantis, for, for, for organizing this and I'm um, looking forward to the CyberSec and AI conference in November. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, so thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much and take care. Thanks everyone for, for listening and watching. Mm -hmm.